Hello and welcome to Conquest Creations. My name is Jacob Lucas and in this video we're going to go through how you can make your first army in the Middle Earth strategy battle game. Now to get into the miniature hobby as a whole there's quite a few things you need. Paints, paintbrushes, glues, clippers, files, scrapers, all that sort of stuff and this video isn't about that. There's a heap of other good videos covering that content. In this video we're specifically talking about the Middle Earth strategy battle game. Middle Earth is an absolutely fantastic game to get into. It is often described as easy to learn but hard to master. And my experience playing it seven or maybe eight years now has proved that to me entirely. Even though I've played hundreds of games of it, I'm still learning new tactics all the time and getting better and better. It's absolutely a game of skill, so it's a perfect one to get into. But this video is about army building, not just me writing a love letter to the game. So. How do you build an army in Middle-earth? In Middle-earth, it's divided into heroes and into troops. Normally, a hero can lead about 12 troops. Legendary heroes like Aragorn King Alessar can lead up to 18, and minor ones like a little goblin shaman can lead 6, but 12 is the average. There's no such thing as fast attacks or elite or troop, it's just all of the troops in one big bundle, and this means that you can pick whatever you want. If you really, really like an elite troop, then your whole entire army can be built around it. This gives you total control over your army and is one of my favorite things about army building. There's no silly rule saying that you can't play an all cavalry army. If you want all cavalry, then you take all cavalry. If you want all elites, you take all elites. There's no distinction between them and it's awesome. The one rule there is that only 33% of your army can have a bow. There are a few exceptions for this, but in general, this is the rule. The game can be played at a big variety of points levels and it works really, really well. Most commonly, people will play between 300 and 1000, which is a big range so it's not that helpful. For building your first one, I would start at 500 and then build it up to 750. Most of the armies that I build, I'll get to 750 and then I'll start on the next project. The great thing about the game is that it plays quite differently at 300 points versus at 1000 points and it still works really, really competitively for both. 300 points is really, really fun because you can do all this micromanaging and every little detail matters so much. Whereas at 1,000 points, you have so many resources, so many tactical options, that it's about looking at the bigger picture and coming out on top. A normal army will have roughly one model for every 20 points. This means that a 500 point army would normally have about 25 models. But don't feel like this is a rule you need to stick to at all. My Goblin Town army can go up to 120 models at 1000 points, whereas my Thorin's Company army at 750 points is only 13 models. That's another great thing about this game, is if you want to go super low model count, you can literally take an all hero army, whereas if you want to go full on horde, you can put heaps and heaps of models on the table, and both of them work competitively but the average is about roughly one model per 20 points. Just gonna quickly interrupt to tell you guys about the Kingdom of Saxonia project. Now, if you're a long time viewer, you've heard all about it, and all I'm gonna say today is that it is for sale on Conquest Creations. If you wanna get it, you can download the files right now, instantly. All right, let's get back into the video. All right, so those are the main rules on making an army, but now let's talk about what options you have for your army. There are 43 factions in Middle Earth. It's absolutely heaps. Basically every single thing from the movies, as well as the lore, has been made into a fully playable faction. Some of these aren't surprising at all, like your Gondors, your Rohans, Isengard, Mordor, all that. But also some of the really niche ones have gotten in there as well. I think Tolkien wrote one line on the Warriors from Khand, and now they have a playable faction, which is actually done really tastefully, and it adds a lot to the game because they've really expanded these factions, making them very unique. All 43 of these armies have their own playstyles and their own pros and cons. If you want a full description of every single army, I have a video of that linked down below. But from what we know about Middle Earth, there are heaps of battles where armies team up. Just look at the Battle of Five Armies, the Dwarves, Elves, and Men of Lake Town all fought together, or the Battle at the Black Gate where the Rohan and Minas Tirith marched to war together. And the good thing is, allies are a big part of Middle-earth. There is an alliance matrix. Factions that teamed up with each other in the lore are considered historical allies. This means that you can make an army of those two factions mixed together. The only rule is that a hero can only lead troops from their own faction. This means if you wanted to ally Gondor and Rohan together, then your Gondor heroes can only lead Gondor troops and your Rohan heroes can only lead Rohan troops. Next, there's convenient allies. These are also called yellow allies. 
These are factions that could have potentially teamed up with each other in the lore, but there isn't an actual example of it happening on the pages or in the films. To make a convenient ally, you need a hero of valor from each army to combine together. A quick side note on heroic tiers, all heroes have a tier. This is something I was talking about earlier when I was talking about how many troops you can lead. Aragorn is a hero of legend, that is the highest possible tier, whereas the lowest is an independent hero, a hero who can't lead any troops. In between there you have minor heroes, heroes of fortitude, and heroes of valor. So heroes of valor are almost the big ones. A lot of these are guys that you've heard about in the lore. Someone like Faramir is a hero of valor, but there's also lots of other unnamed heroes that could represent anyone through the story, and you need a hero of valor or legend to combine two yellow allies. Now, red allies are where it gets a little bit different. These are two armies that never had anything to do with each other in the lore. This is like trying to mix Maug with the Easterlings. It just didn't happen. But the rules still allow you to do that, so if you have a big collection, you can mix everything together. Red allies don't gain any benefits from being with each other. This means if a hero from one faction uses an ability, it's not going to impact their red alliance. So generally these are avoided, but if you want to use the models in your collection, go for it. Now one thing that I probably should have said a little bit earlier is that you can't ally evil armies with good armies. Your good army must be good, your evil army must be evil. Along with all this, there's something called legendary legions. A legendary legion is a specific army list to represent an exact moment in the lore. For example, if you want to play the force of orcs and uruk that captured Merry and Pippin, they have a legendary legion where you can take Ugluk, the leader of the uruk as well as Gorbag, the evil orc that tries to have a go at the hobbits. And when they're combined, this allows you to circumvent the allies' rules so they can work together, and it gives you a couple extra special rules that represent the moments in the theme. There's 20-something legendary legions out now, and I have a video explaining every single one. Now, let's talk about where the rules for everything actually comes from. There are two main books with the rules for almost everything. That's the Armies of Lord of the Rings and the Armies of the Hobbit. This isn't like other games where you get a rule book specific to one faction. The Armies of Lord of the Rings has all of the models for all of Lord of the Rings. This is great because it means that you can actually read up on all the factions, even the ones that you don't play because they're all in the same book. Now that being said, over time, Games Workshop has released expansions. It started with Gondor at War, then War in Rohan, and there's quite a few out now. These expansions contain the legendary legions, as well as any models who have been released since then. An example of the newer models is the big dragon emperor of Rune, the emperor of the Easterlings. He exists in the War in the North book. If you're not sure where you can find the rules for a model, it is in the product description on Games Workshop. These books also contain scenarios for narrative play, but I don't play narrative very often, so I'm mainly interested in the rules for the competitive play. It does seem a little bit silly to me to buy a whole entire book if I just want one profile, so I've snagged some photos of these books just from mates. If you're just starting out, you don't need to stress about them unless there's a specific legendary legion you're interested in. Alright, now let's talk about how you can actually build your first army. My advice to new players is pick your favorite hero from the movies or the lore or your favorite miniature and build your army around them. For example, if you absolutely loved Aragorn, the King of Lessar from The Return of the King, then pick him. Grab your favorite hero and a box of warriors from the same faction as him. So you could grab Aragorn, the King of Lessar, as well as a box of Gondor warriors and you're well on your way to start. Now, because you need one hero for roughly every 12 troops, you probably want to add in a few more heroes. A great way to do this is by getting the command set for the faction that you're playing, because this gives you a banner, which is really important for building a strong army list, as well as a couple other heroes to lead troops. So if you get your hero that you want, your command set, and a box of warriors, you've got a fully playable army that's probably going to sit around 500 points, so it's a great way to start. A lot of the time I see new players really worried about exactly fine tuning their list and making it just perfect. And my advice is that this is a game of skill. No matter how finely tuned your first army is, you're probably going to get stomped if you come up against a really experienced player. This is great because it means that a really weak army list in the hands of a really good player is going to do much much better than a really strong meta army list in the hands of someone who's just new to the game. And the rule of cool does stand very, very true for Middle-earth. There are very, very few profiles that I think aren't very good. That means that everything is playable. 
If you want to get all of your favorite characters, then go for it because the characters all have really cool special rules that really, really accurately represent what they do in the stories. So pick your favorites and go from there. Now, if you do want to get a bit deeper into army list building, I do have a video on how to build a competitive army list. So feel free to check that one out as well. Now, a lot of people have been recently brought into Middle Earth because Games Workshop has released a new starter kit as well as these battle host boxes. These have a named hero as well as a bunch of warriors for a discounted price, so they are a great way to start. My advice would be grab whichever battle host you want the most and then add in the command pack for that faction. So if you grab the Gondor one, grab the Gondor command pack and that's actually going to set you up with a fully playable army that is around 500 points. As I said before, in Middle Earth, you don't actually need a heap of models. Most of my armies are between 25 and 50 models. So these battle hosts actually set you up really, really well. An important thing to note on these battle hosts is that you've got Gandalf, Saruman, and the Witch King, three really, really powerful magic casters. Usually, I recommend beginners learn without using magic, and then it can be something that they get into when they've they mastered the game a little bit better, but we're throwing you in the deep end here. Don't let it discourage you, just know that your first game with Saruman, you're probably going to think he's not done a lot, but as you get better and better with him, you're going to realize how amazing he is. The same goes for the Gandalf the White and the Witch King. And everything that I've just said also applies to the starter set, which I do think is the ultimate best way to get started in Middle Earth. It has two armies that are playable and they're around 500-400 points just out of the box, Add in a command pack to the Mordor side, the Gondor side already has heaps of heroes, and you've got two really, really good armies to start with, and good armies to play with competitively as well. Now this new starter set does have a new rulebook in it, which has led to a little bit of confusion. This rulebook is the same as the old rulebook, but it's been updated with all of the FAQs, which probably is only a couple pages different. So there's no new edition of Middle Earth, it's just a new starter set with a slightly updated book, but if you have the old rulebook, still completely valid, 99% the same, so don't worry about grabbing the new one. Now, if you don't want to go for these battle host boxes and you're looking to buy your favorite models, well, there's two spots to look. Most of the range is on Games Workshop, but some of it is also on Forgewell, which is just another part of Games Workshop. Now, when you're building your army, some of these armies are harder to get than others. Because Middle Earth has been out for so long, since the early 2000s, heaps and heaps of models have been made, and they've come in and out of production at various stages. If you want to play one of the really niche armies, something like Arnor or Khan, those models are pretty rare. Games Workshop is currently bringing a lot of this stuff back into production. Khan was super rare for a long time, but now you can get the models again. So if there's one of those niche factions that you really want to play, you can wait a little while, or you can go to Facebook buy sell swap pages where you can find almost anything. Mahud is a great example of this. It was a super popular faction, and it's been super rare and hard to find for a long time. So Games Workshop said, hey, we're bringing it back. Another thing to note is that quite a lot of stuff is out of stock on Games Workshop. This is just temporary, they go in and out of stock. It's actually a great sign on how popular the game is because things sell out really, really quickly, which is great for us hobbyists who already have our armies but can make it a little bit harder to get involved in. But just keep in mind, that means that you should have a lot of people to play against. That being said, there are also a lot of alternative miniatures out there. If you're into 3D printing, you've got a lot of options, and there's other people who can 3D print these miniatures for you. You've got great creators like Medbury, Cruzluck, and Duvale making awesome miniatures that fit really, really well in the Middle Earth aesthetic. All of the tournaments that I hold, and almost all the tournaments that I've been to, are very, very welcoming of 3D printed alternatives or alternative miniatures in general. You will see people saying you can't play at Games Workshop official events if you have 3D prints. And while that is true, 99%, maybe 99.5% of tournaments are not Games Workshop official, so it's not something you need to worry about. If you have any concerns, you can just check the players back for a tournament or ask the TO, and I'm assuming you'll probably be fine. All right, that's all the information that I had on getting started in Middle Earth and building your first army. If you have any questions, please put them down in the comments and I will respond to every single question that you guys have. If you have your first army list written out and you want to get my thoughts on it, drop it down there and I'll get back to you. Thanks for watching. This has been Conquest Creations.